Good morning, everybody. Man, it has been such an incredible week, and it has been such a joy to be able to be here with you guys uh, every morning. And um, you guys had a good time this week? It's been so incredible to be able to sit back and watch God work in your lives. I mean, watching so many of you cross from darkness into the light. Last night, watching so many of you, Chris, last night, he just, he, he killed it. I mean, that was just in, in, incredible what he did, the way that God used him, used him to speak directly to your hearts. I'm so thankful for that. As, as many of you, you broke the chains, you walked through the doorway, and it's just been an incredible, incredible week. And we've spent much of our time this week looking into this letter of 1 John. And we've seen this this idea of of darkness and light. And and we've talked about what it means to show that we love God and how we love others, right? That a a relationship with God is so much more than just a a, a vertical relationship, but there's such a massive horizontal component to it as well. We've talked about in light of the resurrection, that our failures do not define us, but that we are defined by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He has taken our pain, he has taken our penalty upon himself to set us free. We talked about yesterday that the only way to truly be, to experience the full life that Jesus desires for you to live is to obey what Jesus has told us to do. And this is, again, it's just so important because you guys are going home either tonight or tomorrow. And what we want to do is we want to help help you just begin to develop this foundation that you can stand upon. Because Jesus put it this way. In this world, you will have trouble. In this world, you will have trouble. But he continues and he says, but, but take heart, for I have overcome the world. And we want you to develop this foundation that is found in Jesus. Because church, you will have trouble. In this day and age, there are so many vices that are competing for our attention, for our allegiance. There are so many questions that so many of us ask on so many different occasions and so often it seems that there are so few answers to our many questions. You look around our world, you look around our world and and one of the very first things that we're struck by is this, this, the, the, the amount of hate that is in our world. The amount of division that is in our world, the amount of fear that is in our world. And if I'm being honest, there is so much fear and hate and division in this world that we just begin to become numb to it. Every morning, one of the first things I do, and I don't know why I do it, it generally just depresses me, but I open up my phone and I kind of just look at 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 Twitter to see what all happened in the world while I was asleep. Nearly every morning whenever I wake up, I'll read about a suicide bombing somewhere across the globe. Last night before I went to bed, I I, I read about somebody who busted into a, a, a newsroom in the United States and just started shooting people up. It's everywhere. We live in a world with with wars and protests and riots and the possibility of new wars and injustice and mass shootings. And we live in a world where the church, you, 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 me, where we need to stand up and be the church. And many of you, you've seen this week beginning to come to a close and you've just begun to get this little bit of anxiety in your stomach you know what I'm talking about you just see the days drifting by and you're like I have to go home in three days 
I have to go home in two days. I have to go home tomorrow. And you're scared. You're scared because whenever you left, your mom and your dad were fighting. You're scared because of abuse. You're scared because you're going back to friendships that will not coexist with the decisions that you've made this week. You're scared because you're going back to a boyfriend or a girlfriend that you know is no good for you. But you're scared. I remember after one of the, the, the mass shootings that, that happened in our country over the last several months, I called one of my friends who's also a pastor and I was just talking to him about it and I was like, what do we do, man? Like, this isn't okay. Like, like what do we do? And, and I began to, you know, just try and vent to him. And, and, and he ended up saying these words to me. He said, Andy, if there is one message that we need to continuously preach to the church, it's this. Do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. We are clothed in the blood and the grace of Jesus Christ. Therefore, we have nothing to fear. And so as we get into our text today, we're going to see where John, he goes all the way back to the very beginning. The things that we've talked about so much over the course of this week, John goes back and he begins to talk about them again. Why would John continue to go back and talk about the same things over and over and over again? You guys are smart, you know this. Because he wants you to do it. He doesn't want you to simply hear it. He wants it to change your heart. He wants it to change your life. And he starts here in in 1 John chapter 4, verse 7. He says, Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love, again, this sounds so familiar, does not know God because God is love. Damien said this, love is God's nature. He doesn't have to try and be love. He is love. And to truly uh, uh, contemplate the nature and the identity of God is to allow our minds to be transformed by God. And here's what I can tell you today. If you're going back into a situation, into a home to where you are afraid to go because you're afraid of, of what it's going to look like to love the people that you share a home with, here's what I can tell you. If you have encountered the God of love, you can be a person of love. And this is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning or a relationship repairing sacrifice for our friends. Dear friends, since, we so, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. There's that command again. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us, and his love is made complete in us. And this is how we know that we live in him and and he in us, that he has given us the spirit, and we have seen and we testify that the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. If anyone acknowledges that Jesus is the Son of God, God lives in them, and they in God. And so we know and we rely on the love that God has for us. That's so good. I'm going to say that again. And so we know and we rely, we rely, we lean into the love that God has for us. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in them. And this is how love is made complete among us so that we w- will have confidence on the day of judgment. Here it is. In this world, we are like Jesus. There is no fear in love. But perfect love drives out fear. Because fear has to do with punishment. And if we are in God, we don't have to fear the punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. We love because he first loved us. You see these letters up here. 
depending on how you look at these letters, it will depend what it is that you see. If you look into fear, church, you will see fear. But if you look into love, you will see love. If you look into the chaos of the world, you will see fear. If you look into the eyes of Jesus, you will see love. And once you realize that you are loved by God, it can free you up to live fearlessly in this world. So as my time with you is beginning to come to an end, thank you all for being so attentive this week. It's been a blast getting to talk with you. But I just have three pieces of, pieces of advice I would like to leave you with in light of the text that we just read and the text that we've read this entire week. So if that's okay with you, I'd like to give you those now. The first one is this. Loving people like Jesus means living a life being constantly misunderstood. Loving people like Jesus means that you will live a life constantly being misunderstood. It means that whenever somebody hurts you, you will forgive that person. And whenever you forgive that person, you will have people who will come up to you and tell you that you were foolish because of the grace that you were giving away. It means that whenever somebody hates you, that you continue to pray for that person. And people won't understand that. Because whenever somebody hates somebody in the world, they hate them back. They want nothing to do with them. They don't pray for them. They don't serve them. They don't love them. But whenever somebody hates you, you continue to love them. And people won't get it. It means this. It means that you will do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but rather in humility you will always consider others better than yourself. That is completely counter to the way that our culture lives. But it's exactly what it is that Jesus is calling us to do. It means that you will sacrifice what you have for the good of others. It means that you will live your life not to make yourself look good, but you will live your life to be generous. You will live your life to bless other people and make other people look good. It means that you'll respond differently to trials and pain and turmoil. It means that you'll be more generous than people can make sense of. And the reason that this is so important is because not only did Jesus give us this command to love one another, but he modeled it. I'm going to remind you of the words that I told you at the very beginning of the week. Jesus said this to his disciples the night he was being betrayed. A new command I give you, love one another just as I have loved you. Think about that. Just as I have loved you, so you must love one another. And by this, all men will know that you are my followers. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples if... If you love one another. The second piece of advice I'd like to give you is there is nothing that can separate you from the love of God that is found in Christ Jesus our Lord. You all are here and, and, and you're in this little bubble right now. But soon you are going to leave this place and the enemy is going to begin spitting lies into your ear. He's going to begin to try and tell you that it was just something emotional, that, that it's not something that you need to continue. He's going to continue to try and get you back on the path that you just stepped out, off of. He's going to try and get you to go back into the darkness. He's going to begin to tell you that, that you, you think that you've been forgiven. But as soon as you mess up again, he's going to tell you, you see, you, you didn't change. There's nothing different about you. God doesn't love you anymore, and I'm here to tell you, the word of God says there is nothing that can separate you from the love of God that's in Christ Jesus our Lord. Your failures cannot separate you from the love of God that's in Christ Jesus our Lord. Your addictions cannot separate you from the love of God that's in Christ Jesus our Lord. There is nothing, like absolutely nothing, that can make God stop loving you. Live in that. Allow that peace to transform you. That God's grace is so much bigger than you will ever even begin to give it credit for. And the last piece of advice that I would like to give you is this. Do 
not fear. This is one of the most common commands that Jesus gave in Scripture. And it's one of those commands that whenever you read it, it's like, you know, that, that doesn't even make sense. Like, how do you command somebody, don't be afraid? You know, like whenever I had the snake in my door, I was afraid. If Jesus would have come to me in that moment and said, hey, Andy, don't be afraid, I'd be like, sorry, Jesus, you know, I'm pretty scared right now. How do you command somebody not to be afraid? It's an incredible question, but it's actually one of the most common commands that Jesus gives. Whether he's with his disciples in a boat in the middle of a storm. I mean, even the angels all throughout scripture, whenever they would show up, their words were, don't be afraid. I'm telling you, man, if a big, bright, shining thing came down here right now, I'm going to be terrified. But yet the command was, do not be afraid. Church, do not be afraid. We live in a culture of fear. We live in a culture where they just want to drum up fear. Do not be afraid. The best way to combat a culture of fear is to not fear. Makes sense, right? The best way to combat a culture of fear is to be a light in the darkness. It's to be different. Whenever everybody tells you, you need to be scared, this is awful, the world's crumbling, you stand on the foundation of the resurrection of Jesus Christ and you do not fear. Because if the resurrection of Jesus is true, Ask yourself this question, what do I have to be afraid of? If the resurrection of Jesus is true, what do I have to be afraid of? Because in the resurrection of Jesus, you have victory. You have won. That's why Satan's trying to do everything he can to convince you that you're still in the darkness. It's because you've won. You're the champion. In the blood of Jesus, you have victory. So you are no longer fighting for victory. You are now fighting from a place of victory. Therefore, do not fear. My daughter, my oldest daughter, she's getting to that age and it's so scary. It's where she notices more in the world, you know? And it was just after, you guys remember the, the shooting in Vegas this past fall, I believe. I mean, just such a terrifying thing. People get up and they go to a concert and they don't make it home. And my 11-year-old daughter, she, she heard about this and, and she came to me and, and she said, Dad, I'm scared. I'm scared. It was shortly after the, the church in, in Texas had been shot up. She said, Dad, I'm scared. And I sat down with her, and I gave her this advice. And as I close, I just want to give you guys the same advice. I told her, Whitley, do not be afraid, because our hope is in Jesus. The Apostle Paul, he put it this way, for me to live is Christ. Every day that Jesus gives me on this earth, I am going to live it to point people to Christ. But for me to die is actually gain. For me to live is Christ, but for me to die is gain. My ultimate reward, my ultimate home is not here. It's in heaven. I went on and I told her, I said, but Whitley, the thing that we must know, and this is what I want you guys to hear, is we are not promised tomorrow. You are not promised tomorrow. None of us are promised tomorrow. So make the most of today. Make sure that the people that you love know that you love them today. Make sure the grudges that you're holding, that you take care of them today. Make sure the forgiveness that you need to give, you give it today. Repair relationships today. Don't wait. 
because you are not promised tomorrow. The last little bit of advice that I gave her, I said, so here's what we do, Whitley. We're followers of Jesus, and so we do good. Even whenever the world wants us to do bad, even whenever all we see is bad, we stand on the foundation of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and we do good. We love God, but we don't just simply say we love God. We prove we love God in the way that we love others. So church, do more than say you love God. Shine your light, prove it. Make the most of today. Do not be afraid. There are some of you in this room right now that I, whenever I said this earlier, I could see some of your heads nodding. Some of you are terrified to go home tomorrow, aren't you? You're terrified of what you're walking back into. If you would, if that's you, would you be bold enough to kind of just raise your hand right now if you're somebody who would say, I'm terrified to go home? I see you. A lot of you guys back there, several up here, over here. See you guys back there, some in the very back. If you're anywhere near somebody who has their hand up right now, will you go ahead and just put your hand on their shoulder? And I'm going to pray for you all. And then we're going to continue to worship. My Father in heaven, I thank you for this week. I thank you for the way that you've been moving in this place. I thank you for the light that you shine. And Jesus, I pray as we get ready to leave this place, as we get ready to walk back into the darkness, that we will shine a light. Jesus, I pray for the students in this room right now, the adults in this room who have their hands up, who are scared, they're afraid. Jesus, I pray that your Holy Spirit will wrap his arms around them and that they will know how loved they are by you, that that love will change them, that it will give them the confidence to stand strong in the midst of the turmoil and the trials. Jesus, that you will do something incredible in their homes and in their lives, that people will come to know Jesus. People who are so far from Jesus will come to know you because of these students, Jesus, that relationships will be repaired, that parents' marriages will be repaired, that abuse will stop. Jesus, that you will let us know that you have us where we are for a reason, and that reason is to shine a light. So Jesus, help us to shine in the darkness. We need you, and we call on your name, and we call on the power of your resurrection to do things that are immeasurably more than all we could ever ask or imagine. Jesus, give us not a a spirit of timidity, God, a spirit of power that is found in you. Thank you, Jesus. It's in your beautiful, powerful, holy name I pray. Amen.